In every story, the main goal of the narrative is usually to answer a simple question. Who is the main character? Almost every story uses this as the backbone of the events to follow. Who is Princess Buttercup? Or the farm boy Wesley? Who is number five? Who or what the hell is this? Ugh. These are all questions that the audience should be able to answer at the film's conclusion. But what happens when a story uses the question as the entire film's direction and purpose? Today, we'll be talking about a film called The Usual Suspects, and the burning question, who is Kaiser Soze? Now, that wasn't always the question to answer in the film. From the beginning, the audience is introduced to the five suspects, but the film will begin to focus primarily on Keaton, the ex-dirty cop turned thief turned respectable businessman and boyfriend lover except kinda not look the movie kinda glosses over on the backstories here which is honestly to be expected because the film is told almost exclusively through the eyes of verbal Kent that's the crippled gent sitting in detective Kuyan's custody for the majority of the film since the present story takes place after the robbery and with every member of the original crew whacked verbal is the only one that Kuyan can question the plot of the movie functions as a third-person subjective flashback, meaning that we never see or learn anything that doesn't involve verbal in the scene. And this is a crucial decision in the narrative process, because it lays the groundwork for the major conflict of this movie. There is no way of knowing the truth. Okay, so I just want to be clear on something really quickly. Um, I'm going to talk about the ending of this movie on the next page. I'm not kidding. Right there. I'm going to talk about the ending. If you've never seen the movie The Usual Suspects, I urge you to please stop this video and go watch The Usual Suspects. The movie really deserves your innocent naivety to truly enjoy what a masterpiece it is. Okay, are we clear on that? I, I'm gonna do it. Okay, we good? We clear? Okay, cool, moving on. The movie's story is built entirely upon the foundation of character identity and drive. As the story of how the five all came to be on the boat unfurls, we see Detective Kuyan changing his goal for the interrogation. At first, he either wants to catch Keaton or be completely convinced that the guy is dead. You know, because he loves him so dearly. But as events progress, the story changes for Kuyan when he learns the name Kaiser Soze. Who's Kaiser Soze? Ah, oh, fuck! In fact, the director, Brian Singer, brings that moment into the movie at exactly halfway through the story. From there, Kuyan now has a new goal. Find out who Kaiser Soze is, and find out how Keaton is involved. Eventually, through verbal stories, Kuyan begins to believe that Keaton and Soze are the same person. Now, this is the pivotal moment. This is where the movie does something beyond brilliant. Having heard most of verbal story and being totally convinced that Keaton and Soze are the same person, Kuyan begins to try to get Verbal to admit this. He does so by slowly offering bits of the revelation to Verbal. The audience is now led down a brilliant path of writing, ultimately leading to one of the best twists in cinematic history. As Kuyan forces Verbal to see the light and accept who his friend actually was, Verbal reluctantly agrees with the notion, resigning himself to his fate. Maybe so. But I'm not a rat, Agent Kuyan and that he knows Keaton slash Soze will most likely kill him. He departs the room and gathers his things at the front desk. At this point, the audience has been led through the same path as verbal, and we too now begin to accept what Kuyan is saying, because we have nothing else to go on other than what we think is the truth. Kuyan, satisfied with himself for at least discovering this truth as much as he can, turns his attention back to his colleague and the room before him. It is then that he begins to notice items in the room, items that contain words or elements of verbal stories. We can see the wave of realization wash over him, much like it's washing over us at this point. The truth is made plain to see. Verbal Kent is Kaiser Soze. Now, if you've seen this movie, you're probably feeling that chill on your neck just like I am, remembering the first time you saw this movie and felt the wonder of such a huge revelation. But if you think about it, plenty of movies have done big reveals before. The Sixth Sense, Memento, The Crying Game, Citizen Kane, The Prestige. All of these movies have reveals and twists in them that strengthen the story and shine new light on things we as the audience thought we knew. So why is this movie different? Why does the reveal hit the audience so hard? For that, we have the brilliance of the director Brian Singer and the writer Christopher McQuarrie to thank. 
the two take the very idea of storytelling and throw almost every single thing out the window as they unravel the magic carpet we've all been writing. Okay, I, I know that sounds dramatic and sappy for me to say, but I honestly believe that we're looking at one of the best examples of what can be done with a strong, well-paced piece of storytelling that is willing to be brave. Let's jump back. We're still in the room with Kuyan and Verbal. Kuyan's now trying to open Verbal's eyes to the truth. We're convinced as an audience to believe Kuyan for many reasons, but there are some tricks at play here. Kuyan, for starters, is always filmed looking down on Verbal. This is a film trick that forces audiences to see a subject as knowledgeable and authoritative, as both figuratively and because of angle, literally higher than them. Verbal, meanwhile, is always shown from an upper angle looking down or straight on, making him seem meek or uninformed. Thus, when Kuyan tells Verbal the truth, the audience follows suit in believing it. Kuyan comes at Verbal aggressively with the reveal. He gives Verbal little time to respond or process this revelation, and the audience is treated the same. Now, to really work a reveal in a story to its full potential, you have to be careful with how much processing time you give the audience. The best way to work a huge revelation is to hit the audience slowly, structuring the exposed story around them like a prison, and giving them little time, five to 10 minutes tops, to realize what you've done to them. Before they can respond with questions, the story is over, and the viewer is left to sort through the remains. Singer and Macquarie break this standard by hitting the audience with a fast, hard reveal of the truth. The reveal itself takes less than two minutes, and it completely changes the identity of a character. So, you know the big reveal, ground shaking. T's are crossed, eyes are dotted, the audience feels shocked and misled. It's a classic reveal, and for most writers, this would be sufficient. But Macquarie has more to give us or rather, has more to take away. And that's when Kuyan starts to look around the room. Singer takes this moment to prep the audience with the coming revelation, changing character movements and lens effects. He offers fast cuts between flashbacks and Kuyan's own startlement as he notices the clues. And instead of giving the reveal quickly, he presents it slowly, letting the viewer savor each moment of the twist. One of the best examples of this is when Kuyan drops his coffee cup. The cup breaks silently on the linoleum floor, and this gives Kuyan the first look at the coffee cup's underside, something that Verbal saw many times during their interaction. That's when he first sees the name Kobayashi, the name of Soze's lawyer. Kuyan's stunned expression matches with the audience's own shock. As Kuyan charges from the room to find Verbal Soze, the fax machine finally delivers the sketch artist rendering of Soze, just in case the viewer hasn't picked up on the reveal. And we, the viewer, are now treated to shots of Verbal walking outside the precinct, still keeping the third person subjective, except now we're seeing Verbal's transformation into Kaiser Soze as his gait changes and he adjusts his crippled hand. And through all of this, we're listening to the audio of Verbal's story, the moments where he has concocted this elaborate lie about what happened. Again, most reveals shed light on the truth of a story, but I can't think of any reveals that do what this one does and that's negate the entire story. We now know that Verbal Kent is Kaiser Soze, but that revelation comes at a price. We can no longer trust anything Verbal has told us. The entire movie's plot becomes conjecture, false tales from a guilty party looking to hide and escape. For some, this is a hard thing to take. Roger Ebert famously gave this film one and a half stars, citing the plot as his main gripe. He simply couldn't follow the story well enough to enjoy the film, and the ending made him feel that there had never been a point to the story at all. Now, I'm not going to say that Ebert was wrong. His opinion is just as valid as mine or anyone else's. But I think he dismisses a key element of this movie by taking it for granted. Too often, we expect to be masters of the narrative in a movie. We demand to know all details, and we're upset when there are too many unanswered questions. I think The Usual Suspects takes this concept and tears it apart, stripping the audience of any right to the truth. In essence, the experience of this film is to be completely lied to. And that's something incredibly unique. When the movie is over, the audience knows absolutely nothing except for the identity of Kaiser Soze. The question is answered, but at the cost of the entire plot of the movie. We cannot believe anything Soze has told Kuyan, and that leaves the audience feeling vulnerable. It's a brave move to alienate your audience from the plot, but Singer and Macquarie handle it like masters of the craft. And, true to form, they leave you with little time to make sense of what you've just discovered and learned. The moment we learn Soze's identity, the movie is over in less than four minutes. And like that, it's over.
it's gone. Thank you so very much for tuning in for the very first episode of Something Worth Writing. We are a channel dedicated to the love of storytelling through film, art, books, music. We have a deep, deep passion for storytelling and a deep passion for all kinds of mediums of art. You're going to see a lot of things here like this, a lot of critical evaluations, loving homages to things that we adore. We hope you stick around. If you like this, please like, comment, and subscribe. Share this with people. Tell them to come see it. There's plenty more on the way. And if you don't like it, let us know in the comments below something you'd like to see instead. We're always willing to take a critical look at anything out there. We hope you'll stick around for more entertainment. Thanks so much.